the questioning and the fundamental questioning of meaning. Why should I act like you want me to act? What can we rely on? What could be useful? What could be different and perhaps better? These questions help us to assess, but also to influence our own future. And therefore, the blind defense of everything that exists cannot be the answer to our future. This conference, Inocracy, invites you to, first of all, imagine different futures. Secondly, it's also intended to debate about conflicting guiding principles or maybe priorities when taking impactful decisions. Thirdly, you will learn about which concrete approaches already exist worldwide in politics, economy, but also civil society that give future questions more room already in the present. Transformation processes like the digitalization, but also necessary changes in the face of the climate crisis are very hard to grasp, especially if you're in the middle of a crisis like we're all in the COVID pandemic right now. Transformation processes are hard to grasp if we do not have visual ideas on how the future could and should look like during or after such a transformation. We at Das Progressive Zentrum understand imagination, long-term thinking, and also the development of future visions as strategic tools to our democracy. So let me please welcome you to Inocracy 2020 under the title, Bringing the Future Back to Democracy. Let's try to remember at least the good parts of our teenage selves when we constantly ask questions why things are the way they are and if they could not be better. Inocracy would not have been possible at all without the great support of our partners. And I would like to thank Robert Bosch Stiftung, Open Society Foundation, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Heinrich Böll Stiftung, Alfred Herrhausen Gesellschaft, DENEF, Mehr Demokratie e.V. and Bundesnetzwerk Bürgerschaftliches Engagement, BBE. Something I'm very sure I do not want to change in my future is the brilliant work with our content partners, and I would like to thank them. Many of you, you will meet during um, the Anocracy Conference, during the workshops and toolbox sessions. And last but not least, let me please use one more sentence to warmly thank this wonderful team behind the scenes. Thank you, dear operative team of Anocracy, to make this happen. Have you noticed that the future has gone away? The US historian Timothy Snyder recently posed this question and it made us think. He continued, and I quote, if there's one thing characteristic of the problem of democracy today, it is that the future is gone. If we don't have a sense of the future, if we do not have an idea of which of the various versions of the future is better, it is very hard for people to be involved. We think Timothy Snyder is right. Democracy needs the future. In fact, democracy is essentially about deciding which future should come about. But thinking about the future is much harder than thinking about the present or the past. It requires us to imagine, to use new tools, and it requires us um, to develop visions that are clear and that are tangible. And this is exactly what you will do at Democracy 2020. You will, together with us, imagine what our everyday lives will look like in the year 2035 in our vision sprints. You will learn about new methods and tools of future studies, um, such as world building or futures frequency in our future studies toolbox classes. And you will discuss concrete visions in the most vital policy areas of our time. What should a just European asylum policy look like? What should the future mandate of central banks be? And what is our vision of a post-Trump democracy? In this opening session, however, we will take one step back and ask the question, how can we think and act in order to bring the future back to democracy? So let's dive right into it. For our opening session, we have three speakers with us today who work in very different fields of action, but have one thing 
in common. They all work towards what they believe is a better future, not only for themselves, but for societies as a whole. Jonathan Rosen is a chess master, but more importantly, at least for the sake of today, he's a philosopher and he's the director of the London-based think tank Perspectiva. Helena Marshall is a climate activist with Fridays for Future, a movement that has changed the public discourse in a way that no other movement in the recent years has, and Jens Südekum, who is professor of economics at the Heinrich Heine Heine University, Düsseldorf, and one of Germany's most renowned economists. In his keynote, Jonathan will address five essential questions every normative vision of the future needs to find answers to and guide us through his ideas. After that, we will jump into the reflection with Jens Südekum and Helena Marshall. And for now, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you, Das Progressive Zentrum, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to congratulate Das Progressive Zentrum for the uh, acuity of their inquiry to bring the future back to democracy. And um, I'm delighted to be with you here today. If you can have the first slide, please. So I'm going to talk about five questions. And before we find out what the five questions are, just to let you know that they're, they're thoroughly interrelated. We will, we will come to them one at a time, but in each of the slides, you'll see the other questions are still there with them, keeping them company. It's important when we look at these questions, we see them in the round together. But first, let's back up a little bit. Next slide, please. So I love this quotation by Alistair McIntyre. It's very relevant to our inquiry here. I can only ask the, answer the question, what am I to do, if I can, can find myself in the prior question of which stories do I find myself apart. The stories of our own life have to somehow align with the stories unfolding in the world. For good or bad, that will happen. The question is, how do we make that happen well? And related to that is a question for the collective, which is, you know, when we use the word we, we have to deal with climate change, we have to deal with inequality, we have to renew democracy, that we're careful there about the we, that we are reflective about what exactly we're invoking. Is it a naive we? Is it the we that says we will all be friends? Is it a coercive we? Is it a we that says we must be friends? Or is it something more like a, an integrated we? A we that says we are all different, we will always be different, we will always disagree. There will always be competing priorities in the world. There will always be incommensurate values in the world. Nonetheless, we will find a collective way forward with some degree of tension, some degree of conflict, possibly even war. But nonetheless, we will strive on together. That kind of we is the we we have to work towards. And to get to that we, we need integrated eyes. So I see these two questions as very closely related. Finding one's own role in, in, in the world, finding one's own purpose professionally and personally, and linking that to some broader vision of what a meaningful collective would look like. And I want you to hold those two thoughts in mind as we begin to explore the questions. Next slide, please. So we're here, you know, a progressive Zentrum have got a wonderful little setup there with the flowers and the couches and they're making it look like everything is homely and normal. But of course, the vast majority of us are um, in some version of lockdown or at least um, more constrained about meeting up than normal. And in that context, I want to think about our, our shared context much more broadly, zooming right out. So I call this a different kind of zoom because I really want us to think hard about the shared planet, you know, zoom all the way out, not even to Earth, but beyond that, thinking just how extraordinary life on Earth really is. There are some who believe that even with the eons of time and the sort of magnitude of the galactic space, that there's a chance that we're actually unique. You know, there's a chance that conscious life as we know it, with all that that means for what we love and care about, may actually be one of a kind. Now, there are many, there's a very active debate in the world about that. 
um, and I'm, I don't claim expertise on it. Suffice to say, it's possible that this planet of ours that must have a future because it, it may be the only one of its kind. It's possible. Uh, we should at least be aware of that possibility. And when we think of ourselves and the collective we, we've got to remember that's a we that includes Russia and China and Brazil and India and many other countries that are in a very different space from mostly Western Europe uh, in the early 2020s. That actually a lot of these places have different visions of the future. So the question becomes, as we're looking towards the future, as we're thinking with Helena about you know, how on earth do we deal with climate change or with Jens about how do we get a sane economic system, what are the kind of holding patterns we need so that we get a better feeling for our own individual story, a meaningful sense of the collective, and then how do we go from there together in a way that actually makes sense, that doesn't leave too much behind? So how can we get a story that is as simple as possible but not simpler, as Einstein famously put it. As simple as possible, but not simpler. This is my attempt to do that with five questions. So next slide, please. So the first, the, the, you'll see from the whole slide that we have um, intelligibility and we have capability and legitimacy and meaning and imagination. And they're all, as I've said, interrelated. But the first question, is, you know, basically, how do we make sense of the world? What's going on and how do we know? It's not a small thing. You know, it's not a small thing. We've, um, some say we're in a post-truth world, some say we're in a post-fact world. Um, there are often uh, sources of disinformation and misinformation. Many of you will have seen the recent Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. The fact that we no longer have a shared public realm is not a minor point. The fact that the public realm is mostly mediated by private actors is far from minor. As we're thinking about the future and thinking about our own place and thinking about the collective, we need to find a way to make the world intelligible again. And one of the reasons that matters is that a lot of the intellectuals in the world are struggling to make sense of it. You know, as the, in, the intelligibility of the world is somewhat out of reach beyond, the, beyond most disciplinary frameworks beyond any single perspective. So somehow for intelligibility to be something we can share so that we have some convergence on truth, some convergence on what we do and don't know is pretty important as an axiom or at least a premise for a viable future. And it matters today because we don't realize that unless you solve that issue, unless you somehow get back to a shared public realm where you can disagree about the truth, but in a way that is a shared reference point, that isn't just filter bubbles, that isn't just a million epistemic communities all around the world believing their own version of reality. It's fundamental that we get towards an intelligible world again. And our technology will have a part to play in that for good and bad. One way to understand Facebook and more generally big tech, you know, the harshest view of that is that they're like mercenaries in a culture war that they're actually making profit out of division and polarization and um, their business model is baked into, sorry, is based on baking into our lives forms of division and polarization and anxiety and so forth. Now, they may deny that and there will be counter arguments, um, but certainly the way we access the world today, how we know it, is of fundamental importance. And it's not a single discipline's um, province of inquiry. It's a shared the democratic endeavor to bring back an intelligible world for all of us as far as possible. Next slide, please. Um, are we up to it? You know, the question is, we, we Paul spoke about invoking the future. I don't know how you all feel about the future, your sense of perspective. I have two young children myself and I, uh, I wonder about it for them. What kind of world will they be in? Not just in general terms, what they're watching on the news, but even in the UK, in Europe, in any particular place, um, what quality of life will it be? Will they be looking at ecological collapse every day on the news? Will they feel why on earth couldn't we get on top of, you know, rampant 
inequality that's socially corrosive in nature, what's stopping us? Are we not more capable than this? Are we not up to it? So capability gets to the question of competence, really, about growing into the capacities we need. I mean, some of you may know Thomas Metzinger, the German philosopher, and he has a lovely quotation that says, I'll, I'll paraphrase slightly, but he says basically that as anthropogenic climate change unfolds and it becomes more and more clear that we have failed, that we will become conscious of ourselves as failing beings. But the premise for that, he says, is that we'll realize that climate change exceeded, as he puts it, the cognitive and effective capacities of our species the cognitive and effective capacities of our species. So the question becomes, what are those capacities or capabilities, to use a somewhat different but related term? Are we up to it? You know, what would it mean to educate for the future in a way that we'd actually have the capability to forge a world that would be worth living in, that was ecologically sane, that didn't involve enslaving people, that was somehow wise? What would it mean to get there? So capability. How do we make ourselves worthy of the future, capable of the future, capable of bringing it into being? That's fundamentally an educational question. But I think it's most acutely felt in the context of climate change. Because those who look closely at where we are and where we have to get to in terms of the reduction of carbon emissions, the changing of agriculture, the changing of buildings, the changing of behavior, the vast epic transformation at scale that it's called for, I forgive anyone who says it's not possible because it looks extraordinarily difficult. It's asking a great deal of humanity at scale. I don't think it is impossible. I don't think, it, I think it's conceivable we can significantly mitigate climate effects. But the capability challenge on humanity emotionally and cognitively and technologically and so forth is enormous. And it brings me to the next slide too in terms of how we might go about that. So next slide please. Legitimacy. So it's really like, who gets to decide? Like, you know, it's all very well sitting in a, a conference together and like-minded people saying, here's what we should do, guys. Right? But in the world, as you know, there are millions of competing interests, some more legitimate than others. There are malign forces who seek only their own ends, but there's also honest disagreement. So in the context of democracy, you know, what does it mean to take legitimacy seriously? What kind of forms of governance are we looking at? What is it really the nation state? Is that really our unit of political action in a world that's, that's shaped mostly by financial, act, by financial capitalism that's mostly global, ecological problems that are mostly global, and an inform informational commons that's increasingly global? So where do we place our political hope in terms of legitimacy? What would it mean for democracy to renew so that we have forms of governance, as Eleanor Ostrom might put it, that are really more polycentric that are more truly grounded in civil society, that involve trade unions and churches and other kinds of intermediate associations. That's one of the sources of hope on climate change, actually. The amount of mobilization that's happened at that level, that sort of MISO level of the world, which is not about national governments, but about civil society actors across countries coming together in common cause. But where's the legitimacy there? What happens if those groups of people say we want to do X, but someone else says we want to do Y? How do we build in legitimacy as we're trying to build, develop capability and as we're trying to improve intelligibility? These things are all closely related. So legitimacy matters. How do you make it so that everyone buys into it? It's a big question. The next, next slide, please. And all of this for what, right? So I was very glad some years ago Das Progressive Zentrum translated into German my report called Spiritualize, which was about trying to be, bring back spiritual questions into the public domain. So that the ultimate matter of who are we, why are we living here, what's of ultimate value, what is the nature of reality, these are not, these are not your day-to-day -day democratic concerns. They're not the kind of things that um, political economists contend with. They're not even there when you're thinking about technological solutions to climate change. But they underlie everything. Our implicit sense of what's going on in the world, what ultimately matters, is driving everything else, right? Our sense of meaning and purpose has to be fitting for our times. 
meaning is not ahistorical. There is something about finding the meaning of our lives, both individually and collectively, that depends upon reckoning with this historical moment and all of those different facets, how to make more sense of it, how to become worthy and capable of it, how to find forms of legitimacy so that everyone can get on board in, the, in a certain sense without necessarily agreeing, and then how to like make sense, how to, how to say why it matters. Meaning, the meaning of life is a democratic question, you know, and it's one that we have a shared interest in exploring together. Because when you're coming to new economic thinking and looking for, for example, alternatives to gross domestic product as a telos for society, you need a vision of the good life. You need an alternative story of what we're living for and why. And to make sense of that, you may need a theory of human nature. And you may need to get some buy into that. It might not be universal, but I think we should get beyond the idea that everyone will ever agree with anything. But nonetheless, you want to build a story of human nature, purpose, and value that is anchored in the public domain. It's not just about closing your door and having your spiritual life at home, finding your meaning on TV and in whatever you're having for dinner. Somehow the question of what we're living for together has to be a preeminent, preeminent democratic concern. And it has to be there when the politicians are telling you about their latest tax cut or their latest um, plans to reduce carbon or their, or their idea for social reform or their educational plans. Ask them, what is the ultimate source of value here? What are you trying to do? Bring that back into the public discussion. At first, they will blush. I've had experience of this. They're like, really? You're asking me these fundamental questions? I'm a politician. I don't do that. I just tell you our next promise so you can decide to vote for me or not. But no, our job as people who care about bringing the future back to democracy is to bring the meaning of life back to democracy too. Because if that question is not attended to, the future will not take care of itself. Next question, please. Next slide, please. Which is also the next question. Yeah. So um, this is not a minor thing either. Um, already, actually, Paul alluded to this at the start and Polina too. One of the challenges we have is, you know, what does the future look and feel like? And it's important to get that and feel because if you only think about what it looks like, we have a problem because we're, we're visualizing the future with our, with our present. And that means we find it hard to get beyond things like education is in schools, health is in hospitals, um, nation states are the unit of political agency and currency. Um, if we really want to imagine the future, we have to sort of allow ourselves to feel our way into the kind of harmony and beauty and sensibility that we would hope for. But let's be real here, in a world of eight plus billion people, we're of, of a hugely different circumstances and context, some much more stable, much more vulnerable than others. So this is far from clear when you're imagining the future and trying to bring it back to democracy, how we go about it. You know, there's a methodology question here. Imagination, we sometimes think it's like gazing out of a, a train window and like, I'll just imagine the future now. No, it's a rigorous process. And artists are often there at the forefront. Those who actually work with creative impulses, reaching somewhat beyond their grasp, often able to illustrate or convey something without being able to fully articulate it. Not because they lack the words, but because what they're pointing towards hasn't fully formed yet. It's already in a kind of intuitive, um, you know, um, nascent form. It hasn't yet taken full form. So when we think about imagining the future, uh, take it seriously. You know, don't just think it's about a sort of idle venturing. And it comes back to the other issues. You know, if we're going to imagine the future together, if you're going to have, for example, people's assemblies to talk about the future, they better talk about the meaning of life too. You know, they better bring that in and they better deal with legitimacy. Um, they better think about how this is going to happen. What kind of mandate are you going to have and who's going to contest it and how will you deal with that contest? And you're going to have to think about um, whether we're up to it. You know, do we have the tools required to, for example, significantly reinvest in the humanities education, or to bring for every government to have an artist in their cabinet or their ministry? What would it mean to really take this imagination question seriously? And then, of course, you know, coming back to the the first issue, how to make sense of it? You know, if you're going to campaign on bringing the future back to democracy. 
and imagination is a big part of that. How do you persuade those people in hard power positions? The the politics, the tech, the politicians, the technocrats, the people for whom politics is about control above all else. And you're saying, look, your control and your tinkering with the political economy has got us to this crisis point. And now we need some other forms of governance and some other forms of direction and inspiration. How do we go about that, right? And you're saying, well, here's some methodologies. Here are creative things we can do. We can experiment with metaphors. We can move with our work with our bodies in space. We can simulate scenarios. We can improvise and try and be other people. Things that will look flaky, right? I don't know what the translation of flaky would be in most other languages, but it means things that would be ridiculed because they look like they're somehow not important or they're not serious or they're pre-intellectual. No, most of the stuff is post-intellectual. It's saying there's a limit to what the intellect can do. And democracies need to contend with that too. Finding a way beyond the, beyond the intellect to actually bring the future to bear in a way that has meaning, that is intelligible, that develops our capability. And that is also in some sense legitimate. And legitimate epistemically in terms of being a valid form of knowledge, but also legitimate politically in terms of having the backing of the public. So those are the five questions I would ask you to grapple with as you're thinking about your plans to bring the future back to democracy. Because unless we deal with each of them, unless we can make sense of the world together, unless we can build capability so that we're up to it, we have the skills required to build the world we're talking about, and sometimes literally build, sometimes break down, but sometimes build. And unless we can also somehow make it legitimate so that everyone can see that this process is correct at some fundamental level in a way that maybe isn't true of our current democratic systems. And unless it's meaningful for many, and unless it has the imaginative power that we need to deal with the first planetary civilization, really wondering whether it will survive. Unless we can do that, we'll have some, some troubles, more troubles. But the future is there for the taking. And um, I would encourage you all to do your best to conceive of it, feel your way into it, and make it tangible. My job here this morning was not to talk in policy terms or in terms of your next day at work, but I ask you as you go into those things, as you go into making this specific, that you keep these questions in mind. It's been a great pleasure talking to you all. Thank you very much. Um, for your keynote and for the five questions you gave for, to us all to keep in mind when talking about how to bring the future back to democracy. Dear participants, what we do at Democracy is that after every single input, we will send you into breakout groups for 15 minutes where you meet three other people and have some room and space to get to know each other and maybe speak a little bit about how you, how you liked what you heard and if it helped you. So we will send you now into breakout groups before we will go into the reflection um, with Jens Sudokom and Helena Marshall. During the breakout groups, um, we will ask you one question, which is, what are your initial thoughts after hearing the input? And has it made you think differently about the future? So please enjoy the breakout groups now, and we see you back here in 15 minutes. Hello and welcome back from the breakout groups. For the reflection of Jonathan's keynote, we have invited Jens Sudekom, Professor of Economy, and Helena Marshall, who is a climate activist with Fridays for Future. So this format of a reflection is set as um, a 30-minute open discussion or maybe conversation between two or more people. And after some point of listening to um, Jens and Helena, we will also bring Jonathan back into the debate and see if they have some reflection to the reflection to make. So please um, enjoy now the reflection between Jens and Helena. And we would like to pose the first question as a starting point, which is looking at what Jonathan talked about through the perspective of your specific field of action, which is economy and climate activism, what can you most relate to or where do you maybe disagree? Enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm. 
Okay. You want me to, to start? Right now? So, um, well then, welcome. Great to be uh, with all of you. And uh, yeah, I must say for me, it's a bit of a challenge um, because it's a very different type of conversation that I would normally usually have. So as an economist, I'm more like the technocratic policy advisor and I don't talk about the meaning of life very often, at least not in public. Um, but I try to you know, come up with um, pragmatic solutions, how to come from A to B. But um, I think Jonathan did a great job in this keynote and I can relate at various points to what he said and I'm coming to that um, in a minute. But I'd like to um, reflect a little bit on, on one concept that was mentioned in the blurb of, of this session and that's this concept of Tina. So there is no alternative because, well, if you think about bringing the future to democracy, uh, it's about this uh, concept that it's in our hand to decide on what the future should look like. And Tina, the concept sounds terrible in that respect um, because it sounds undemocratic. Uh, if there's no alternative, um, there's nothing to decide upon. Right? Um, and I'd like to reflect if that actually the case. Um, and to be honest, I think it's not the case. Tina doesn't apply to all problems, or maybe not even to most problems. But there are certain problems in the world, um, probably the hardest problems in the world, for which Tina essentially applies, in my view, and from my perspective as a policy advisor. And I'm not talking about um, the pandemic right now. I'm mostly talking about climate change. So for climate change, it is essentially a Tina question. There's nothing to debate um, about this. There's no alternative to mm -hmm tackling climate change and uh, to become serious about um, global warming. And there's, I think, not even a serious question about the degree to which you have to do it. Um, so it's a pretty narrow band somewhere between 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, maybe 2.5 degrees. Somewhere within that range, we have to settle and there is essentially um, no alternative. So now the hard question is how to get there, um, how to achieve that goal, okay? Is that also a TINA issue? Um, is there just one possible way um, to achieve this goal and to reach the green zero, so climate neutrality? I like the concept of green zero because usually my usual work is about fiscal policy in Germany, so I talk a lot about black zero, um, so not incurring public debt, but here today it's about green zero. So is there just one possible way? Is it a TINA issue? And my answer, I mean, I may be wrong, but my answer is sorry, yes and no. In the short term, no. So in the short term, um, you can have sensible debates. Um, you can always have debates about details. But in the longer run, um, I think it becomes a TINA issue. So it's not only the goal in itself, but also essentially how to achieve this goal. Um, also, at some point, becomes a TINA issue. And there I'm a bit more optimistic maybe um, than what Jonathan has said. So Jonathan has raised all sorts of problems um, in his five questions about capabilities, um, about divergent views, about you know, the coexistence of, 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 of um, realities that are completely incompatible with each other. But um, I think, I mean, when I think about visions for the future, about all these debates in the longer run, uh, initially, in the first stages, you can have the sensible debate, you can have um, a debate about different options, about alternatives, but I really firmly believe in progress in discussions and progress in human development, that eventually it becomes clear in rational terms what works and what will not work. And I firmly believe that these rational best alternatives will eventually prevail. So just very briefly, I don't want to talk too long to have a debate. Um, what are possible views about this climate change problem, right? One is, uh, and it's still very prevalent uh, in society, is basically saying, well, it's all just a hoax and we don't have to do anything about it, right? So many people essentially still think in this way. One of them is unfortunately the current president of the United States. But it's factually wrong. And I firmly believe that because it's factually wrong, it will eventually die out, this debate. Um, the other vision, is that you have to fight climate change by um, a radical shutdown of economic activity, okay? So a naive version of degrowth, as you want to put it, okay? That will also not prevail because, um, I mean, the pandemic has shown uh, essentially 
even in the heydays of uh, the, the, the lockdown, where essentially the world economy stood as still as never before since the Second World War, um, that the reduction in climate change on that day, I think it was April 26, was tiny. It was something like 15, 16% compared to 2019. So you can imagine what you would have to do, right, to reduce emission if you would go down that avenue. It's impossible in my view. So more subtly, among my economist friends, I mean, that's my background, um, a very popular, popular view is that, yes, we have to tackle climate change, but we have to do it by a common a global CO2 price, okay? Either in the form of a tax or by tradable permits. Um, and any effort by a single country or a group of countries like the EU to unilaterally act and introduce um, a carbon price just for those countries is essentially uh, totally ineffective and inefficient because it will just hurt um, those countries. Um, it will cause a drainage of, of industry and carbon leakage, but it will have zero effect uh, on the climate. So that's still a very, very prevalent view. Um, also, let's say, in the group of people I usually interact with. And on a conceptual basis, I mean, there's something to that argument, right? Climate change is a global problem. It's a global problem of common action. It's a global externality. So in the first best world, um, of course, we would like to have um, a correct CO2 price on a global level. True. But at the same time, the argument is very quietistic, right? Uh, it's a defensive it's a defensive vision, and that's why I firmly believe it will also not prevail, also within my own discipline. In a sense, we know for 40 years what the first best uh, would look like, right, this common CO2 price, but we also know for at least 40 years that there has been little, almost no progress on this front. Um, I mean, there were no binding agreements uh, of any sort, and... Um, Unless there is a miracle that occurs that all of a sudden a global binding agreement becomes possible, there will be essentially no progress on this front. So that's why I think, moving back to Tina, I really believe that having this discussion, um, it will become clear that there is essentially just one possible strategy that we can pursue. And that is if a group of countries, the more the better, will actually forge ahead um, and introduce instruments to tackle climate change on their own shores okay and um that with comes with a combination broadly speaking of two elements one is um economically massive private and public investments um to decouple economic activity from emissions and resource use more broadly speaking and the second element is um to achieve by, uh, by raising public awareness to, to achieve an adaptation of consumption habits, right? And so my final thought is, I believe Fridays for Future has played an enormous and super important role in pushing that debate into that direction. And um, actually, I believe um, they will be an important part of this TINA solution. So let me end with a quote. Uh, so in preparation for today, I read a report that um, Fridays for Future commissioned so in Germany, commissioned um, from the Wuppertal Institute, right, basically uh, asking what exactly now do we have to do to uh, achieve this goal of 1.5 degrees at most climate change and to become climate neutral already by 2035. Okay, and let me just give you um, a quote. The introduction of climate neutral technologies is only possible via a forced strategy of research and development, a rapid marketization supported by appropriate incentive systems, and then a comprehensive rollout of non-fossile technologies. An ambitious CO2 price is an important instrument, though not sufficient on its own. Those investments will also give Germany great export chances on growing international climate markets. Right? So if you read that, at first, I thought, who has written this? Was it McKinsey? Was it the EU Commission? No, it was Fridays for Future. And I think this is great. This is a great development um, because it has basically demonstrated that there is a convergence. So Jonathan talked about a convergence of views. So this is actually a quite rapid conversion. Look at the debate where we've been like five years ago, a rapid convergence. And this is the way to go that um, to become real, right? And um, Will it be easy? So can we just rely, okay, now we've initiated the convergence, now it will happen automatically and the problem will be solved without many problems? No. So Jonathan raised five questions, which are super important, but I 
like to stay optimistic here. Um, we have achieved a lot. The public discourse has changed totally. Uh, talking to CEOs today is a very different experience than talking to CEOs or high-level politicians five years ago on those issues. So the convergence has, has made big progress. And I think Fridays for Future is one important element in that. And therefore, I'm I, uh, really looking forward to what Helena uh, has to say about that and uh, about the next steps. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think go, going off what you said, I feel like, so at the beginning, Jonathan talked about we and kind of defining who we is. And um, especially in the discourse of, you know, how, how, what, how I talk about the climate crisis and how I try to talk to other people about the climate crisis is that I actually avoid um, saying we because obviously the climate crisis is our collective problem, but we are not all equally at fault. And I think, you know, recognizing that and saying, it's not that we have to act, it's that governments and corporations and the people who actually cause this crisis have to act. And because especially when talking about, um, you know, the climate crisis, we come into a habit of talking about consumption and saying, this is a problem that we all need to face. You know, if we all just use more Tupperware, um, we would fix this crisis. And if we all just, you know, started riding our bikes one more day a week, we could fix this crisis. And that's obviously factually not true. So I feel like sometimes um, because we don't define, you know, who are we and what do we mean by that, saying we distracts from who is actually responsible. And that's the same way when you talked about the how which nations need to act, because saying, oh, this is a global problem, so we all need to act, you know, subsequently leads to no one acting and no one doing anything. And that's kind of, you know, that's what we keep having to come up against is that, you know, we say this is our whole problem instead of talking about what actually needs to happen and what steps we need to take. And I feel like then that's the next step we come to, which is capability. And that's exactly why we actually had to commission the study, because the German government didn't have the idea on their own to have scientists think about what steps, you know, have scientists look at what we actually need to do in order to stay in line with 1.5 degrees, which, you know, German government signed five years ago almost in Paris. And, um, and that shows, and the study showed that it's doable. We can be climate neutral by 2035. So we have all the technical tools. And, you know, basically the study, which the quote you, you read actually was not written by us, but by the Wuppertal Institute who, you know, did the study. Um, and um, there, that basically what, what, they're, what I at least think is the most important thing that in the end was written in this 120 page study is that they say our problems or that's what, that what is stopping us from addressing the climate crisis is not technological, it is political and societal. So, and that means that we as Fridays the Future have obviously um, been, and that's where we put pressure. We put pressure on our governments and we put pressure on the people who are going to make those decisions. Um, at the same time, we do need to tell new stories. And I think that's where we come to this point, imagination, where we look at our policymakers and we look at the people who we've elected to be in charge. And they, they you know, I feel like it was most, um, there, there's so many points where, where it keeps coming up to this place of there is no innovation whatsoever uh, concerning political instruments. So after, you know, we had a, a, a an economic crisis through Corona, and the best idea our German government had was to again, after two thousand eight didn't work, to try and, and you know subsidize cars again. And you know, we had to go onto the streets and we had to have huge protests um, in order to stop them from from using this idea that doesn't work. It's economically unviable. It's you know environmentally completely stupid, and it's and it's not even you know socially um fair and again we have another you know and even though we fought against this idea and in the end it thankfully did not you know get included in the in the investment packet they're talking about this idea again and i feel like that's the problem that we there's no ex innovation so we don't throw ideas out there's no innovation we don't come up with new ideas in governments and um there's a complete lack of visions and i feel like you know by, by starting to talk to each other and, you know, start conversations in society where we talk about not only how hard are the transformations going to be and how, you know, all the changes we need to make, but also how wonderful they could be. You know, what do our cities look like when there's no more cars taking up all the room? And what do our energy systems look like? And what do, what does our, 
you know, public sphere looked like? How can we interact with each other when we address that climate crisis? And I think that's what um, spoke to me most. And I feel like that there's also, um, you know, definitely needed in the, when looking at our economy, you know, telling new stories. How can we make an economy that works for more people and that doesn't destroy our environment anymore? Um, but I feel like you can say more to that. Yeah, so. <laughs> who, 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 shall, who shall speak? Uh, who, I mean, who shall I feel like next? we have a little bit more time now to just, oh, thank you. Shall I, shall I say something in response to both of you? Yeah. So um, thank you both. So I am, um, the, the policy work I'm most proud of was actually on climate change. Back in about 2013, 2014, I worked on Little Else. And it was a, a kind of, a political awakening of sorts because I was initially asked to work on climate change from a behavior change point of view. It was really about how do you get people to change their light bulbs, how do you get people to change their diet, maybe fly less, buy different cars and so forth. Um, but quite quickly I realized this wasn't really going to work and um, you know you wake up to the nature of the macro economy and you wake up then to the forms of governance that sustain the macro economy and then the kinds of political sociologies that lead to certain kinds of governance being elected and driving that macroeconomy. And, and we're in this phase of history that's sometimes called, um, well, not phase of history, but they're one of the preeminent sort of ideological flavors of our time has been called neoliberal. And the reason I use that term with quite some, some technical precision, hopefully, is that it's the state-led remodeling of society on the model of the market. And that's the best encapsulation of new liberalism I've, I've heard, and it comes from Will Davies. The reason I mention that now is that when you come to an issue like climate change, what I feel very strongly is that while it's true that climate change is about everything, it's not true that everything is about climate change. In other words, to actually grapple with the preeminent collective action problem of our time, yes, we need to think across sectors. It's it's absolutely about the macroeconomy and it's absolutely about fundamental debates for what the macroeconomy is for. And those debates will take place in a public sphere with vested interests, which is where questions of legitimacy come in. But it's also true that when you're picturing a new world, your macroeconomic measures alone will not get you there because climate change co-arises with all of these other issues. Even in the ecological sphere, it co-arises with biodiversity loss, which is much more geographic in nature. And when it comes to the problem of fossil fuels and, and maybe ceasing in, to invest in fossil fuels and changing pension funds to um, so that we're no longer investing in that future, but in a different kind of future, then those things, those places have a location. You know, there's a, the fossil fuels exist in particular places around the world. There's lots of them in the US, lots of them in Russia. You know, there's some countries that have very few at all. And so when it comes to decisions about how will we stop using fossil fuels, keep them in the ground, or how will we have a, a global uh, price for carbon that everyone can agree on, we need to think hard about the question of legitimacy. And to get that legitimacy, you'll have to get through intelligibility. And to make a story of it make sense, it will have to be a story that where capability looks plausible. And um, all of which is to say, I don't know um, exactly how one deals with climate change at a global level. I do see how nation states can do much better. But when it comes to thinking of this as a global collective action problem, I'm no longer confident you can get to 1.5 or even 2. I think the default scenarios are much more like 3 or 4. And, and therefore, optimistic in the sense with Jens that, that it's possible. I do believe it's possible. But the, that kind of political possibility only comes through grappling with questions of what are people living for? Why would they get behind something like this? Why would they choose this to be their issue and not something else? And that's why I think issues relating to meaning and purpose of life are fundamentally economic in nature because it's about telling the economic story in a way that you can get a critical mass of people behind, not just in Germany or in Europe or the UK, but actually around the world where it has to happen. And how is that going to work in China or Russia? for example. Now, I don't mean that as some kind of stray question to answer. I just mean when we're giving our vision for what to do about the preeminent collective action problem, let's think about how all of these factors 
co-arise. Because I think unless we do that, we will make some progress here and there. We'll win lots of battles, but we might lose the overall war. Uh -huh. yeah. No, but if, if I can uh, say something about that, I mean, I, I totally agree. But I, my point was that I think, I mean, in this, um, in those dimensions that you've mentioned, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last five years, right? So the public awareness of the importance of this issue uh, today, I mean, okay, now it's uh, COVID-19, but uh, just prior to COVID-19, climate change was, was number one priority in the public discourse in Germany. And uh, I think almost all people, I mean, maybe not all, but the vast majority um, has, has now realized what's at stake, right? And I think, I mean, having gone through various economic crises, I mean, uh, think about the euro crisis, Brexit, and so on. I mean, it, it tends to be the case that solutions always come in the last second, right? Um, but then they come, right? Uh, so, so, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, you were talking about the global uh, issue, right? I mean, I, I mean, at the moment, um, I'm involved in the discussion of the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and in the scientific advisory body, because it's about um, when Europe introduces the climate uh, a CO2 price, right? The immediate danger is leakage, right? So that basically, uh, all that happens is that Europe, the demand for fossil fuel, for example, Europe uh, decreases, the fossil fuel price decreases, and other countries will just demand more, and then essentially you have achieved nothing for global climate, right? Um, or in the worst case, you have even a relocation of uh, heavy industry, right, from away from Europe to somewhere else, again with uh, a net effect on the climate of zero, right? So basically, um, how to tackle that, right? We're discussing at the moment about this carbon price border adjustment, right? So essentially saying, if you want to export to Europe, fine, but then you will have to pay uh, the same CO2 price at the border. So some call it to be a tariff, but it's not, right? It's more uh, tantamount to a value added tax, okay? Um, and this has an effect, I think has an immediate effect. One is that there are certain firms in other countries that export a lot to Europe, right? And if there is a price, they may become you know, considering their production technologies and there's an incentive to move to climate neutral production, which is good. But then there's another aspect, and I think this is more uh, related to what you said. I mean, the reality is that probably with this border adjustment, we will not be able to fully avoid this leakage, right? So Europe will lose certain industries, other countries will gain. So in a sense, it's like shooting ourselves in the foot, right? But I think by this, by doing that, right, the next step towards global cooperation becomes more likely because Europe can say, look, I mean, we have now, we have gone a step forward. We have done something which is potentially hurting ourselves, right? So now China, now US, what do you bring to the table, right? I think uh, this step is a possibility and I think a realistic possibility to go one step ahead in terms of global cooperation. I mean, I look at this, I think, with like another degree of intensity, just because we have so little time. So I would love, I, I kind of have an ambivalent relationship to all of these questions, because I would love to spend all day talking about how can, how can we create a more collective story and how can we imagine a future. But at the same time, and you know, that's because I've spent two years now just reading about the climate and you know being a climate activist and seeing that we're not making enough progress. At the same time, I'm kind of I'm kind of always thinking like we don't have time for this. Like you know we can't wait until there's a, a, a degree of collective action. We just need to you know reduce emissions fast. And I feel like that's that's why we need to also talk about all of these questions away from the climate crisis and talk about them you know concerning other topics you know like democracy like you know, culture, society, and so on. Because a lot, a lot of times, even though the climate crisis obviously intensifies all of these questions and is maybe a perfect example to discuss them at the same time, I'm kind of always thinking, um, well, maybe we can talk about that later because right now we just need to, you know, have policy that reduces emissions fast. And I feel like that's kind of uh, my perspective because, um, because, you know, we just, we just, we have so little time and um, so I would rather, you know, maybe skip that step and just, you know, act. Hmm. Dear speaker, um, do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So unfortunately, having very little time also 
applies to our session here and we only have uh, around five uh, more minutes for this reflection. But I have a question for you which came uh, through the chat from our participants. It's uh, quite specific and it says, um, it goes to all speakers and asks to imagine and feel the future vision. Do you think countries should adapt a well-being budget like in New Zealand? And I would maybe like to ask one of you who can explain what the well-being budget in New Zealand is in a compromised sentence so that all of you can give a short answer to our participant. Thank you. Um, shall I begin? I mean, do I, I mean, I don't know if either of the other speakers know more precisely what a well-being budget is, but I mean, I understand that uh, you know, it's not the only country, I believe, New Zealand, where well-being has become a policy concern, and it sort of straddles mental health and public health, and um, but it will also mean having impacts for budgets relating to recreation and leisure and, and education and so forth. But in essence, it's the government saying, look, it's our job to work for the well-being of society, at least partly. Um, and do I think that's part of the future? Yes, I think uh, reorienting away for profit uh, for its own sake is wise and necessary. Um, I also feel well-being doesn't go far enough personally. I think well-being is a often a very subjective state of um, sort of pleasure and purpose to some extent. Um, but I would like to see it moving into visions of sort of human unfolding and developing and even flourishing because I think you need a story that's not static. You need a story that actually takes us into the future as developing beings who are growing all the time. Um, uh, but so that we can think less about economic growth and more about sort of aesthetic, personal, inter, inter, you know, relational growth. Um, because I think we, we, human beings do need that sense of progress and purpose. Um, but I think it's important we don't get it just from uh, one particular measure of economic output. Sure. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've kind of find it difficult to talk about this concrete example because I feel like I haven't, you know, I don't really know enough about it, to be honest. But I feel like um, getting away from, you know, um, economic output as a measure of, a, of success of politics and policy is a really important step because, you know, I think it's quite obvious that with limited resources that we have, and limited capacities are, we have as you know and as our, that our earth has we cannot you know keep growing exponentially and getting away and you know uh, 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 taking away that measure as success of politics and looking at different areas whether that be well-being or whether that I'm, I'm you know we can probably take different measures i think it's a really important step to you know have a success in combating also the climate crisis and combating um, you know what the, the the biggest threat, I guess, to to my well-being as a, as a young person. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So I have a slightly different view on that. I mean, I'm not an expert on on the New Zealand uh, well-being budget, but you know, considering what Hannah just said, right? Um, we have to act fast. We don't have much time left, and I agree, right? Um, and that's why I think. I mean the. Again, coming back to the study of Fridays for Future, comparing it in essentially, for example, to the Green New Deal of the EU, it's not that different in the end. Uh, the difference is the speed, right? It's the intensity and the speed of with, with which to act, right? And I agree there are lots of arguments to say we have to act quickly, right? But if we have to react quickly, then we shouldn't get lost in too many debates which are, which are not essential and not key. So I think we don't have to have lengthy debates about is GDP measured in the wrong way and so on. I mean, as an economist, I understand as soon as there are externalities, uh, output is not tantamount to welfare, right? So I think there is a big danger that we just get lost with too many meaningless debates, right? Uh, it's clear where we have to go. We don't have much time, right? So therefore, coming back to my view, that essentially the, the, the steps forward is almost like a TINA issue. We should rather work on that. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree but, there, to be honest, because... So um, can I... Can I, I go ahead. I, Paulina, I just wanted to say I disagreed. <laughs> that was all. We won't have time to say why. 
<laughs> if you can do it in one sentence, I would be most delighted to do okay. well, I mean, me too. I think, me I, I, think, I think climate change is, is, is the defining feature of the 21st century. This is not a problem that's going to go away. So mentality that says let's fix the, fix the problems, I think, is fundamentally misconceived. I think we have to realize we're living with this now. It's already here. There's a sense in which we've already failed. We're beginning to succeed. We need to succeed much quicker uh, and at scale. But I think as we do that, we cannot drop all the other issues. Life carries on. There is no way you can hold the rest of the world constant while dealing with emissions alone. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, thank you very much. That was, that was important to hear that last part. Um, dear speakers and dear participants of Anocracy, we were 100% conscious that we were bringing to this opening session three people who have very different backgrounds and perspectives on this topic. And therefore, we are especially grateful that you agreed to come together and listen to one another, reflect about what one another says, and to find out about similarities but also differences until the very last minute. That's great. Um, many of the subjects we just barely scratched in the keynote but also later in the reflection will be talked about much more during the conference so please just go through our program and look for the sessions you would like to d deep and d dive in deeper in the next um, three days so what we will do now is that we go into a short break of 15 minutes and come back to this very live stream at um, 1 30, 1 30 p.m. Central European time for the very first vision sprint. A vision sprint is where we actually asked visionaries to tell us what their day looked like in what one day in their life looked like in, in, the, in the year 2035. So it will be very um, creative and I hope that you will like it. So um, thanks to all the speakers. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Helena. And thank you, Jens, for being with us. And yeah, have a good break. See you back here in 15 minutes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.